Um, now, I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that the future of humanity is going to be urban. In 2008, we passed a major milestone where more people lived in cities than in the countryside for the first time ever in uh, history. And uh, you look at some of the figures by 2050, 70 percent of the world will live inside of cities. And there's always interesting facts that come out of this. You know, uh, McKinsey and Company is, is stating that by 2020, China will have uh, 2025. China will have 221 cities with over a million people in them each. So that's just this phenomenal growth of large urban centers. And if you think of it, the city really is the ultimate in green products it, cause, because it involves so many different elements. There's green building materials and, and building design. There's energy distribution and production. Uh, energy distribution is one of the most challenging, actually, uh, problems with it. Transportation, of course. We all have to ride trains and cars and things like that. Food and waste. Um, but here's the problem, and I've seen this time and time again in a lot of different areas, is that there's also, along with multiple avenues, there's also multiple actors. This is not like the IT business or any other business. You have politicians, along with uh, private enterprise, along with tenants and building owners, and it's very difficult to get them all to cooperate at once. Uh, in fact, in the US, we have, and I'm, I'm sure in Europe, we have the, uh, it's called the, the split, split responsibility rule. The building owner does not really care about fixing up the energy efficiency of the building because it doesn't benefit him directly or else he doesn't think so. And the tenants can't do it themselves. Uh, some of that's changing, but it's still there. You also have another big problem we've seen is uh, large banks and mortgage holders. People changing the building, making it more energy efficient, using sort of a, a bond and uh, you know energy efficiency as a service method angers incredibly amounts of banks. In fact, a number of initiatives in the U.S have been sunk because banks have said, we won't allow it. It's like you're putting a lien on the property. And there's also utilities and power providers. You know, will we have solar? Will we have storage? Who's gonna own it? Big problems. And history has so far not been good. I look at, uh, I specialized for a while in green building materials. And most of the companies I covered back in 2006, 2007, 2008 are bankrupt. Uh, they, couldn't buy, they couldn't get contractors to actually pick up the products. Um, there's also a lot of inertia, but let's also look at the positive side too. Um, in the past two years, there's been a number of actually comprehensive green city initiatives. If anyone has been to um, Japan and talked to Panasonic, there's the Fujisawa product and their project. And they're basically taking an old television factory, a factory that was actually like this factory, it was making tube TVs. Now it's going to be a thousand homes. It's almost, you know, almost like urban recycling. Uh, and in Stockholm, there's the Royal Seaport. It's been a, uh, a derelict area since 1916. There's a big oil depot right in the center of it. And they're going to use this, actually, the, the oil depot is gonna become an opera house. And there's going to be 10,000 homes, 30,000 shops, ferry boats that get charged on DC power, which is more highly efficient. And it's going to be this actually attractive neighborhood. In fact, it's interesting, in Stockholm, they have one neighborhood they built for the Olympics, uh, a green, sustainable neighborhood. and. Two years ago, I was visiting the city and I was talking to the mayor. And they said, yeah, we were embarrassed by this. We, we thought nobody would want to live here. We thought it would be a retirement community because you know, we, just, we weren't sold on ourselves. And it became incredibly popular and a number of young couples actually moved there. So now it's one of the most thriving neighborhoods there is. So there is hope. I don't want to uh, bound too down. It's just not easy. But enough from me. Uh, my name is Michael Canellis. I'm a consultant at a firm called Eastwick. We do we consult with uh, energy companies, and now we'll go around the table and have each of the panelists discuss uh, their point of view and things like that. First, we have Alexander uh, Danilin. Alexander, if you could just. Спасибо большое. Я представляю. Thank you very much. I'm a Microsoft company representative at this round table. And at first sight, some people might think, why Microsoft and why green uh, houses, uh, green technologies, and energy saving, water saving? But I would like to point out the fact that uh, I'm not an occasional guest here. Uh, the de city development, uh, population growth is one of mega trends which define development of society and economy in the nearest future. And unfortunately, this mega trend is supplemented by another mega trend, which is the following. There is constant uh, rupture. And there are forecasts that it will uh, still exist in the nearest 20 years, a rupture between gap between accessibility of water, energy products, food products, and demand in those um, products, especially demands of cities such as electricity, 
and water. For example, the megatrend of city development is connected with an another negative factor with negative consequences of such development. Uh, we can see two examples. Cities account for 2% of um, a square uh, of Earth, but um, cities uh, consume 80% of, of energy and generate 75% of carbon dioxide, and that's a problem. How history shows, people often manage to use one megatrend to compensate ne uh, negative consequences of the other. And there is megatrend connected with technology development and penetrating use of these technologies. And if we talk about IT, uh, the majority of analysts and experts point out the fact that uh, within um, IT technologies there are five uh, powerful megatrends. The first one is cloud calculations, second one is um, use of uh, big data and uh, analysis of big data da databases, third trend is connected with mobile calculation, the fourth is connected with social communication, social nets, and the fifth is eventually has eventually revealed itself it's the internet of things and in fact i'd like to show several examples uh, in order to show how these five technological megatrends help to compensate negative consequences of a megatrend of developing of cities if we talk about cloud calculations uh, four or five years ago, uh, representatives of IT industry started to talk about clouds, and they initially talked about the fact that clouds will uh, give um, unlimited possibilities to store data, and uh, they will um, give unlimited uh, resources, but nobody could imagine at the point that in five years, the opportunities of cloud computing will be used to store uh, huge masses of uh, data which generate, uh, which are generated by different devices, and it's called uh, Internet of Things, and it's a great number of indicators, and they can be incorporated in the city infrastructure, in the transport and building infrastructure, and they can generate a uh, huge masses of information, and it would be impossible to store them uh, without uh, cloud computing. It would have been impossible to analyze them in real time without uh, work of uh, big masses of information and without analytics which is built around them. And we see at the moment that lots of projects of city development are based on the uh, use of these opportunities and opportunity of social communication. We all know that 73% of grown-up population who uses internet uh, are uh, registered in uh, social nets, and so the opportunities of social communication uh, provides a raising public awareness about awareness how they consume electricity and other resources, and this enables us to um, a struggle for economy and without mobile computing uh, we wouldn't be able to use these technologies in mobile devices in mobile objects such as transport infrastructure uh, of the city and thus we see the value of internet of things is uh, that it has a lot of uh, huge masses of data uh, which is generated by these indicators and we have an opportunity to analyze this data and on the other hand uh, the thing which makes um, cities smart cities is uh, the mass of um, mass storage of this data i can uh, show two three short examples how they are used in practice the first one is connected with Microsoft Campus. Uh, Microsoft Campus is a middle-sized city. It's uh, two, 200 hectares square, and there are a lot of buildings, and they have about 40,000 um, employees. It was been developing in the run of 30 years, and um, when it faced uh, the task of energy efficiency management, it was the following. The um, utility payments accounted for $60 million per year, and um, 
in that region of Seattle uh, city where campus is located, energy is quite cheap. The first option to solve the issue is the following to get rid of everything which has been done before and to uh, start from the first point it was impossible because uh, this variant accounted for 60 million dollars and uh, another option uh, was adopted they wanted to incorporate the existing city infrastructure the internet of things a large number of indicators and to uh, gather information to analyze it and to use uh, certain models to manage the system and to foresee different challenges and to eliminate them uh, so uh, 550 thousand indicators were installed in the campus and uh, they indicated uh, billions of points for computing and of course without cloud services it would be impossible to analyze all the information and the company eventually uh, managed to save uh, six six eight percent of um, uh, energy costs and it tried to uh, reach the payback uh, within the uh, year and a half and another example a small uh, town near Paris which is called Isile Molina it's a suburb of Paris actually and uh, there is a very simple solution accessible for any city starting from megalopolis uh, and ending with small towns a simple idea if uh, citizens are given actual information about how they are using these or those resources including uh, electricity uh, this stimulates economy and efficiency so a portal was created for the citizens and the implementation the use of this simple portal and information helped them to reach uh, energy efficiency and economy of 10 20 percent um, of the costs for electricity and so that's the way how it technologies help um, uh, solve uh, different challenges and to uh, save time I will stop at this moment because I have another example of Seattle uh, and they had some analog um, challenges and solutions and so to sum up I'd like to say that it's interesting uh, IT technologies and modern trends in IT industry enable us to solve problems of uh, smart cities future cities and uh, resources efficiency and that's why Microsoft is here that's why we have different initiatives of uh, Microsoft City Next and within the framework of this initiative we try to uh, incorporate and gather this data this knowledge and these solutions from our partners as well who are connected with urban development and urban infrastructure and uh, this initiative help us uh, to lead the way in all the countries including the Russian Federation Um, Microsoft, in a way, sort of also shows the difficulty of some of these challenges. Back in 2009, your company came out with a product for managing home and measuring energy consumption in, in people's homes. And then it was taken off the market within a year. It just, it, it did not, customers didn't want it and things like that. But I'm wondering, how, how should we think of Microsoft in these large markets? Will you be the company, you make software and cloud services where you'll take data from building management systems that exist, like ones put in by Honeywell and Schneider and things like that, or ABB, and you'll analyze that data and feed it a classic IT, or does Microsoft have greater ambitions to actually move into software for controlling devices and managing them and things like that? Uh, well, to some extent, we remain a platform program a, uh, 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 company, but the elements added to our platform are uh, uh, the elements of machine learning, uh, cloud machine learning, uh, HD inside, they allow us to uh, build up these forecasting models uh, of behavior of uh, such um, tools like uh, heating installations uh, or support the uh, temperature in the building. So we're moving in this direction. And as for Internet of Things uh, connected with it, it's very prospective for Microsoft as well. But nearly all of our products are connected with the use and the uh, involvement of partner solutions, uh, without which uh, it is impossible to cover such a complicated sphere.
very much. And next we have uh, Joss Browers. I hope that I pronounced that correctly. He's a professor at Eindhoven University of Technology. And I, I almost feel like calling you Professor Cement because you're actually a world expert in green building materials and especially ones composed of cement, gypsum, and lime. Things that people don't think can be improved or haven't been improved sometimes since the Roman era. Maybe you could tell us the work you're doing. and. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I prepared a presentation, actually, and uh, perhaps it can be displayed. Okay. And is there a controller, perhaps? For... <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, uh, I will show you a few um, slides about um, yeah, building materials and why it is important uh, and what the relation between building materials and sustainability is. First of all, I will show you where I come from. You can see uh, the world, a picture of the world, and then you can see Russia and Western Europe, and then the Netherlands, a very small country in the west of Western Europe. And, oh, something goes wrong here. Okay. Uh, that's the Netherlands, and um, I'm from the south part of the Netherlands, the province is called North Brabant, and there you can see the city of Eindhoven, and it's the fifth biggest city in Holland. Okay, I was asked also to explain where I, can, where I come from. Uh, um, this is the university, I'm from the Department of the Build Environment, uh, the chair is Building Materials, and my group consists of about 20 scientific staff, and uh, the topics are eco-building materials, functional materials, and green materials. And the external funding of my group is about 1 million euro per year, and that's uh, public funding, but also private funding, or private funding leveraged by public funding, and so on, hybrid, basically. Uh, if we look at the production of materials in the world, this is the global production of all materials in the world, um, we can see timber, steel, plastics, gypsum, quicklime, cement, and then we make uh, 21 billion tons of concrete of that, that's huge. That's by far the biggest produced material, produced than, than all other materials combined. And uh, if we can look at these five, four materials, they are exclusively used in the building industry. I mean, steel, plastics, and timber are also used in other sectors, but these materials are exclusively used in the building industry. So there's, uh, this costs a lot of materials, transport, uh, excavation, uh, mining of uh, extraction of materials and also the building sector is the biggest producer of waste in the world. So this asks for improvement and closing of material cycles. Well, fortunately there are also byproducts that are available like coal ashes, one billion tons from the power generation of coal, of, uh, uh, coal. Uh, blast furnace lag from steel production worldwide 120 million tons and uh, flue gas desulfurization gypsum 50 million tons which is also a byproduct we can substitute primary gypsum uh, like coal ashes and flue gas desulfurization gypsum if you look at modern coal fired power plants uh, they collect the fly ashes from the stack gases and also sulfur is collect, uh, uh, removed from the stack gases so there is an environmental benefit and less air pollution, and we create uh, supplementary cementitious materials. Uh, well, this is concrete, uh, an overview for people who don't know it. It consists of water, cement, and then uh, aggregates like sand and gravel. Well, the cement industry is doing a lot already concerning uh, its reducing its environmental footprint. Uh, traditional cements consist of clinker, which is made, made in these kinds of kilns, uh, which uh, consume a lot of energy, raw materials, limestone. And, um, well, the cement industry is substituting, substitu substituting clinker by these byproducts, like coal ashes, uh, slags of steel uh, um, production, but also the concrete industry is substituting. So they, they buy cement, blended cement, and also they mix in uh, waste materials or byproducts to reduce cost and to reduce the environmental footprint of the material. So basically here you can see an overview. Usually you use clay and limestone as primary materials for the production of clinker, but you can substitute clay for fly ash, you can substitute fuel for waste, and in the kill, and then you have cement clinker, gypsum, and yeah, you can see the, the, the products where uh, clinker is substituted by fly ash and by blast furnace slag. Well, this is also stimulated by a lot of uh, economic and um, societal uh, developments. 
we have in Europe uh, new standards, which uh, yeah, it's called the ECO, um, the, the European Norm 206, which allows you to uh, develop alternative concretes which have less cement, for instance, if you can prove the ECO performance. Uh, there are new contract and procurement forms which stimulate innovation. The CE mark, which facilitates cross-border trading of building materials. Then we have environmental legislation in the Netherlands, the soil quality decree, the landfill decree, which help you to turn waste materials into building materials. Uh, then we have also rating systems, like in America, the US LEED, and in Great Britain, BREEAM, which give you extra points, which gives you a building a better score when you use less primary materials and when you use more recycled or secondary materials in your building. Well, this all leads to innovation, fortunately for my group, and um, this leads to eco-materials, functional materials, and uh, green materials. Well, uh, um, examples that we investigated in my group is recycled concrete. We investigate so-called smart crushing. I will not go into detail into that. It's a patent and technology. Paper sludge incineration fly ash, that's a new byproduct coming on the market. Also has very good features for incorporation in concrete. Biomass, we see more and more biomass incineration plants for making green electricity, but they also produce typical fly ashes, which are different from coal powder fly ashes, and which also, yeah, we are researching how to make, turn them into building materials. Then we have a lot of municipal solid waste incineration plants, because solid waste is incinerated. You can make electricity, hot water from it, but also byproducts are remaining, and we turn un, uh, the unburned matter, and we try to turn them into building materials. Then waste glass, and also mining waste, acids, tailings, minerals can be turned into building materials. Also that we do in my group. Well, I will go, if I have time, I will show one innovation. Yeah. Um, what we can also do besides lowering the environmental footprint of building materials uh, is give them extra function because we build a lot. Uh, the building industry uh, consumes by far most materials in the world. So we can also give extra function to building materials because they are everywhere. And some, one feature that we can give building materials is to make them self-cleaning and also air purifying. And here you can see materials that we made self-cleaning by applying a photocatalytic material in the top layer. And you can see that these materials, where photocatalytic material is applied, is self-cleaning. This is simply an empirical test. Well, it has been applied already in this church in Rome by architect Richard Meyer, where this titanium has been applied in the concrete. Well, the next step is uh, of what we also, what this technology is also doing is to clean the air. It's removing, uh, turning nitrogen oxides into nitrates, so catch, removing them from the air, so helping to improve the, um, uh, the air quality, especially in inner cities, where you have a lot of uh, pollution because of car stacked pipes, as long as we don't have only electric vehicles, of course, uh, then the problem is also solved. Uh, but um, uh, this titania in the top layer of pavement stones, combined with UV, it is activated by UV, so you need sunlight, uh, turns uh, this and removes this nitrogen oxides from the air. Well, we, we developed these stones in the lab, uh, this is a lab, lab uh, set up, and then we tested it in a street, outdoor measurements, and here you can see how such a measurement looks like. Uh, on the left you see all the peaks from the vehicles and on the right you can see the street where it has not been applied and the street where it has been applied. And here we saw a reduction of 45%. On an average we had a zero situation uh, where the pollution was almost the same in the streets and in the active situation measuring the whole day it was 90% lower with a standard deviation of 18%. And when we only look at afternoons, when the sun, sh uh, when the sun uh, shine is stronger, of course, then the reduction is 28%, also with a standard deviation of 20%. Well, this is very short. It has been published in Chinese newspaper, Sun Kao Xiao Xie. Uh, my, uh, op my opposite people will know it probably. Uh, this was in 2008. And uh, later in CNN, in 2010, it was uh, reported. This is a screenshot from the web page. And then finally also last year BBC uh, came and made an item of it. I don't know if, if we can play the film, otherwise, oh there it is. Perhaps we have sound.
how much money you can save by that one. I think people will have to invest in it because otherwise you have to pay far more for healthcare. Scientists from China, South Africa, and the United States have all shown an interest in the revolutionary potential of this new technology. Anna Holligan, BBC News, in Hangalore. Okay, then the final slide. Uh, please switch to the PowerPoint. You should switch to the swamp forest, but all the original trees have been cut down. You can see here's the old tree. I say cut the trees, they didn't set fire to the house. Okay, thank you. Clear away the scrub. Usually it's a Okay, thank you. Last slide. Uh, the partners and the funding. Um, here you can see the organizations and companies uh, that sponsor the research. And uh, well, with that, I can close. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you. We'll be coming back to this uh, issue too with uh, Dr. Rong here. But I have a question. It's, yeah, I look at the first stories. You know, it's 2008, and then you know, which was now six years ago. How long would it take? Will it take? It's a fascinating uh, discovery. A fascinating technology, but. How long does it take to get to market, and what are the main concerns? Is it the, the cost, or are there genuine structural issues that you know engineers and architects actually want to, to look at before they trust it? Well, the technology actually is quite old. It, uh, it was invented in Japan already 20 years ago, the patents, but uh, it, it was very difficult, or it is still di difficult, to prove that it is working. And still now people are critical about the technology. Um, because it's difficult, there have been outdoor experiments before, but uh, they were not so well chosen, the locations. Because if you take a place where there's a lot of wind, a lot of dispersion, then it's difficult to prove what the stones are doing. Um, and even with these figures, uh, health authorities still want to see more proof before they accept it as a compensation measure in cities, for instance. Uh, so actually, I'm looking now, or with foreign partners, for another demonstration project where we have more evidence for this technology. So environmental agencies, governments actually, are quite reluctant, but they are the, yeah, the, the limiting factor in this technology, not the costs. And one thing, if I may, just before we go on to Irina, how, what is the, the way an invention like this, because you worked at it during university, gets to market? In the U.S., it's a very, the system we use is the professor would then license it to a company. The company would take it public, make millions of dollars. The professor would make millions of dollars, but never leave academia. It's a strictly, it's a handoff approach. Is that, are you looking at, do they, would you use the same sort of system, or are you working with large conglomerates who are licensing it and things like that? Well, we don't have patents on it. We only know the technology, how to make this concrete. Um, so it, it, it's difficult to protect it with patents. With most of these materials that I've shown you, it's difficult to protect it with uh, patents. The be, uh, what we do is protect the technology. We keep that in-house. But um, the companies that we work with, they sponsor the research. So the res they sponsor the university, not me. I I'm, I'm don't have a company. I'm not a consultant, nothing. Um, but, um, uh, but the results of the research, they sponsor PhDs or postdocs or whatever, but the results of the research are for them and they are free to implement it in practice. Uh, and next, uh, thank you very much. And next we have Irina Ilina. She's the Doctor of Economic Sciences and Director of the Institute for Regional Studies and Urban Planning. Uh, and an expert actually on uh, basically sustainable urban planning. I'm going to give us an overview and... Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues, and today I would like to tell you about how uh, green cities and green technologies uh, are important for Russian Federation. Uh, what is the need in our country uh, in the introduction of uh, new green technologies in order to improve the environment in the cities of the Russian Federation? And here in my uh, report, I would like to dwell on the uh, three moments. The first one is the characteristic of the situation we have now. Uh, overall, in the Russian Federation, we have uh, 100, uh, 1,100 uh, cities. Um, 
Uh, the majority of them are small cities uh, where there are um, less than 50,000 people. And it is natural that small cities, they don't have such budgets as our mega cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. And it's hard for them to solve the issues connected with their state of environment. The second point is a high level of pollution uh, of air. And if we look at uh, the reports of our committee of the Ministry of um, the Protection of the Environment, we will see that from the number of uh, the cities, we have uh, 138 cities have a high or very high level of air pollution. Basically, uh, those are major cities, but 57% uh, of uh, uh, the population uh, uh, in the cities are living in, in favorable uh, conditions of uh, in air pollution. The next uh, environmental problem uh, that is quite acute in the Russian Federation uh, are high losses of uh, fresh water. Uh, and if we take generally in our country, the losses of water make up 12.5%. Uh, uh, that's 7, um, uh, 7 7.5 7 million cubic meters every year. That's a fantastic figure, you see. And the th third problem uh, we should pay attention to is a problem of uh, waste, municipal waste management, solid waste management. Uh, currently, we have an, a goal uh, to uh, have uh, the percent of uh, this utilization to 14. And that's uh, not a very high figure for such a developed country as uh, the Russian Federation. And what is more, uh, I want to say uh, that um, uh, annually the landfills uh, have uh, Oh, 115,000 uh, hectares, uh, and that's actually the territory of Moscow. Each year we uh, give this area for landfills, you know, and uh, that's uh, a bomb that will uh, burst sometime or other, and uh, the future generations will have to do with uh, work with it. That's about the problems. The second point, uh, second part of my report um, is about uh, the fact uh, how our cities are, uh, whether they are ready to introduce the green technologies, and here we face uh, the thing uh, that the um, need in green technologies is high, but the possibilities are low. Our institute this year carried out an analysis of the uh, possibilities of the Russian cities, uh, the potential of the Russian cities uh, in uh, turning them into green cities. We analyzed 144 uh, uh, 144 cities uh, that are uh, that have a good economy, and one third of them only uh, have a potential to introduce uh, short-term uh, innovative uh, green technologies. Uh, generally, these uh, cities. Oh, uh, these cities have uh, former uh, uh, scientific centers. They have uh, high qualifications of the labor resources. Uh, there's a number of uh, cities that have uh, um, um, large-scale uh, city enterprises, and those are northern cities. Um, because our northern city is located uh, in the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation. Uh, they have uh, high costs uh, for the maintenance of uh, life support systems and the introduction of green technologies, smart technologies, allows uh, to save uh, a lot uh, in the utility costs. Uh, these results are very interesting and it seems to me that uh, the definition, uh, defining of this potential can be this very bridge between the needs and the introduction of the technologies. Uh, for sure, we try to analyze uh, foreign experience, uh, and um, I would like to speak about that as well. We've studied the experience of the European cities in the introduction uh, in the formation of uh, smart uh, city technologies and uh, defined uh, uh, smart uh, infrastructure, smart mobility, uh, smart economics, uh, smart environment and a smart social sphere. Although uh, we can develop more, uh, we can speak about smart healthcare, smart management, and so on. And according to the results of our estimates, uh, it turned out that the majority uh, of uh, those uh, smart uh, Western cities uh, have 20% uh, of which have uh, green technologies at their disposal. And it's very important because uh, solving uh, economical problems, uh, we solve uh, the environmental problems. And this creates special conditions uh, to improve the quality of life, uh, quality of uh, the environment. And for Russia, it's very important because unfortunately, we have such a trend that people from small cities go to large cities. And small cities. Uh, 
uh, lack population uh, and there's uh, a depopulation effect. And the introduction of smart technologies uh, would at the same time allow to increase the standard of living and maintain uh, the livability of these uh, small cities in long term period. And the third point I would like to note uh, is the research we carry out in our university right now. Uh, we are trying uh, using uh, foresight technology uh, pr to prognose um, and the specific uh, need uh, in green technology, in smart technology, uh, for the Russian cities. Uh, during a long time, uh, we've collected uh, signals, uh, weak signals, and we've um, defined uh, the areas uh, that are in demand in the Russian cities first. Uh, those are the technologies connected with energy efficiency. And I can say that here uh, we have some kind of coincidence. Uh, from On the one hand, we have a demand, a high demand in energy efficient uh, technologies. And on the other hand, uh, we can talk not about uh, small uh, signals, but about trends. Because uh, officially, uh, the state level uh, has uh, the solution, uh, the decisions on uh, uh, energy efficient building. We have our own uh, standards uh, in energy efficiency buildings, and it's very important. Above that, uh, we've considered the need uh, in the technologies connected with the protection of the environment. And I would like to say that uh, we have uh, the highest need in the technology connected with uh, waste management. And it's very important, once again, uh, because uh, in reality, our market uh, is, does not have a lot of such uh, uh, technologies, uh, though both population and municipalities are very interested in that. Oleg will uh, further um, will tell about it later. Uh, uh, mm. Uh, he will uh, tell us about the Moscow experience, and it would be very interesting how uh, the population reacts to their pilot project uh, in waste management. And in conclusion, I would like to say that not with, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, I can quote Tolstoy, understanding the fact that we have a lot of problems in the Russian cities. Uh, he said, uh, all um, uh, families um, are miserable in, um, uh, in different ways. Uh, we can create programs uh, aimed at uh, separate cities, uh, because everything depends uh, not only on some basic problems of the city. Everything, uh, a lot depends on its geographic position, climatic conditions. It depends on the demographic situation, on what economy do they have, what uh, economic sector is developing, and every, uh, a lot depends on the population and the incentive, uh, incentiveness of uh, the municipal authorities. We have examples when uh, during short-term period, uh, and that's an example of uh, city of Rochelle in, uh, Moscow, in the Moscow region, they had uh, problems in the energy sector. They uh, got a new mayor and they tried to solve a lot of uh, problems introducing new technologies. Uh, so we have wonderful prospects uh, for the green cities of Russia. Thank you. Irina, one question is, you talked about energy efficiency being in high demand. Are there any programs or technologies in particular that have been successful? I mean, one of the problems with efficiency is that people understand the need to do it, but they sometimes lack the willpower or lack the, the financial mechanisms aren't organized in a way to make it worthwhile. For them. Is there anything that that has stood out in your mind that has really been effective? Uh, uh, yes, we have technologies, and I uh, wanted to give you an example. Uh, uh, that's the installation of uh, special sensors uh, connected with the Internet of Things when consumer can regulate himself uh, the consumption of resources in his own house. And. Uh, it is in demand uh, for individual houses. You may know that we have a lot of dachas, cottage houses in Russia, and that's a second uh, house, uh, an individual house. And uh, there is a demand for such houses uh, for these technologies because people understand how important it is to save the resources. People pay themselves for the introduction of these technologies. As for multi-story buildings, we have a governmental program uh, to install sensors to measure water, energy consumption, gas, and that stimulates people, uh, but less because they do not feel the effect of this economy. Uh, it really feels, but uh, not to a significant way. Uh, and I think that there should be some kind of uh, uh, programs to raise the awareness of people, uh, for them to take their uh, flats like their personal homes. And uh, we have quite a lot of such examples. The comment you had, I've been talking to a lot of companies, and I work with one called Ayla Networks that does Internet of Things for energy efficiency in homes. 
And they're finding that security becomes the number one driver, is that people can look at their vacation home or look at their home away from home and think the door is not open, or if something happens, they immediately get a picture of it. So they, they, um, they think about efficiency, but security becomes the driver, and if you combine the two, it's really accelerating sales right now, where uh, all the companies, in fact, are shifting toward emphasizing security first, and then efficiency. It's almost like getting two for one. Yes, it's a very important aspect, and I think security is uh, very important both for a separate house and uh, on the whole social security is important because uh, smart technologies are very important for that. Uh, because a lot of cities, uh, for a lot of cities, it's a, very, it's a key moment because we had some questionnaires, polls between population and people state that security and environmental issues are the most important for them, not financial and not economic issues, but these ones. And I think that these sensors and monitor systems in the house enables you to monitor the situation in your house via mobile phone and you see everyone who comes and we see a lot of video cams uh, which control the um, rapid reaction on emergencies and we've uh, noted that there are new technologies which not only collect the current situation data but they also analyze it and make the forecasts for the risks for public transport for public spaces where a lot of people gather um, okay. and next we have uh, George Gogolev I hope I pronounced that correctly um, you've been in the private sector you've also worked for governments you also worked in LEDs, which is actually my single favorite technology. And right now you're working on a on Eco Lounge, a nonprofit project aimed at the built environment. Maybe you could tell us about that and also uh, just anything about your perspective on this market. Yeah, sure. Uh, I also work for a government fund of funds, the Russian venture capital. So, and for us, the venture guys, all the problems Irina outlined are possibilities. Uh, because, as you've mentioned, they're quite a few major technologies, well, technology sectors, uh, which should be changed to make a certain city green. And in Russia, we're faced with aging infrastructure. And uh, the cities are either going to face the status quo and stay the same and not change and decay, or they'll have to go forward and bring up a new vision. And of course, the more a city consumes, the more uneconomical it is, and the more it pollutes, the less people like it. And again, it's bad for the local economy. So cities have to look in the direction of becoming green, even though, as we all know in Russia, the problem with uh, leadership is critical to unlocking these markets. Because for us, uh, greening cities, greening the energy sector is essential to unlock those markets for small and medium-sized companies because those are the main companies which are going to benefit from it. Large vendors also on the city scale, but then again, you'll need a lot of those service providers and diff different technologies locally. Um, the problem is when you're trying to plan a project to green a city, it always lasts longer than the city government. I was 10 years ago working on uh, in a group on a document called the Urban Environmental Accords, and we had a very major fight about uh, the timing we should put in the accords. There was one guy from the Oakland city government who said, you can't plan anything green in the city for less than 100 years. You can't plan it. In a period of less than 100 years, you don't do environment. And then there are guys who are like, listen, your ma average mayor turn is four years. You know, they, if, if a guy's going to commit to anything to do anything in five years, he's going to be out of the office. He doesn't care, right? So you have to make him do something in less than four years. So the problem is with democratic governments and democratic processes is that sometimes people would commit to uh, uh, changing their city, and then the new government would come and have uh, a different perspective. Yeah, for example, Moscow has signed those documents in a few other cities, and they haven't done anything, and that's, that was 10, 10 years ago. Um, on that note, yeah. where is, uh, we'll ask about Eco Lounge in a second, but where is it succeeding? I mean, what cities have actually been able to put this together to have a long-range plan while having mayors come and go? 
Sorry, what, what is, is this? Is there any city that's right, that succeeded in doing this? Because you have the situation where you do have a long range plan, they want to last for 100 years. But making a lo longer term plan? Yeah, has anyone been able to pull this off? You know, balance well, actually, I have not seen anything like that happen in Russia, but th that guy, uh, Randy from Oakland, he actually had a 300 year environmental plan for Oakland in California. So that he actually had it in place. So it was extremely serious about that. And tell us a bit about Eco Lounge. Oh, Eco Lounge. Uh, it's a club where um, environmental professionals and uh, people from um, any large companies who are interested in environmental issues gather regularly about every month and discuss environmental issues. So uh, sometimes we do stuff on green building. And uh, because we work very closely with the Russian Green Building Council, uh, which actually got a very serious boost during the, the Olympics because uh, the International Olympic Committee actually pressured Russia uh, to use green building standards in all the stadiums in Sochi. Uh, so that's a, a one good outcome of the Olympics. We actually created a green building industry and uh, now we have a lot of professionals in our country which are capable to implement those t standards uh, and certify buildings. Thank you very much. And now we'll move on to uh, Ma uh, Juan Rong, Deputy Chairman of Glass Subcommittee in the Chinese Ceramic Society Beijing, an adjunct professor at Beijing Aviation University, and a specialist in building materials. I wonder, sir, if you could give us an overview of what you, uh, your work and some of your opinions on this matter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I speak uh, uh, by Chinese. Uh, The, um, the speech will be translated consecutively in English. Uh, то, что вы, э, добрый день, мои коллеги, э, то, что вы уже сказали, сейчас... Uh, the fact that you've mentioned it's a great problem of, um... the spending of materials and also uh, governments need to pay attention to the fact and up to 2015 uh, we are planning we are planning to implement the projects and we have two marks at the moment we have a mark of environmental protection and a mark of uh, green construction Green construction and supplement materials. Green materials demand uh, economy. They need to uh, economize in the aspects of uh, energy resources to, prote to protect environment and to economize spending of materials and to improve microclimate uh, within the premises. And our, our standing, our standards of green construction, uh, we have five categories of that.
So this shows that up to 2013, we had 1,446 projects which uh, were given the status of green construction. But regarding uh, the total volume of construction, it's a very small figure uh, because China has annual uh, uh, square meters of uh, construction, uh, 2 billion square meters. This year, the Chinese government uh, has set um, standards for green construction. And we need to improve the standards in order to economize the costs of uh, and the uh, spending of materials and to improve environmental st status. So uh, they need uh, en energy efficiency uh, strategies to decrease the uh, expenditures of materials and, of course, to sustain um, uh, security and convenience of use. And uh, he, here you see four stages. At the moment, we are at the second stage. And that is, we need to carry out decisions uh, after the environment has already been polluted. And everybody knows that green, uh, then green construction uh, needs green materials. Uh, this May, our government. Our government supported the enterprises in the field of developing and uh, production and distribution of green materials, and uh, projects uh, are invested from the state budget. And it's important to use uh, materials with the status of environmental protection. This decision, the decision of this issue, is uh, uh, demanded a lot of effort uh, with the implementation of uh, industrial waste. And simultaneous decrease of other materials, we uh, have produced wall panels with these uh, improvements. That's the process of construction. Uh, the houses uh, with the use of our materials. And that's the approximate procedure, uh, which accounts for 15 days. That's the production line of the panel. 
That's the structure of our panel. It has three parts. The metal carcass, the uh, layer of thermal protection, and facade. That's the products for construction. That's the photo on the construction site. Uh, you can see that the problem connect, connected with communication have been solved. Uh, we have uh, produced everything beforehand. Uh, our company has already signed an agreement uh, on cooperation uh, with uh, uh, different uh, companies, uh, Moscow State University and RVC company, and we uh, want to implement uh, new technologies and to distribute uh, them and to use them in the Russian market. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, no, it's, it's all right. I, just a quick clarification. Do you have an R value yet for your insulating wallboard? And what is the, the price premium? I mean, have you, have you been able to estimate that? Um, So, uh, five hundred dollars approximately. Thank you very much. And now, last but not least, we have uh, Anton Chuba Kubachevsky, the appointed head, Department of Nature Management and Environmental Protection. Uh, speak about what you're doing, and also, uh, as Irina pointed out, tell us more about the waste problem. I'm <laughs> I'm totally fascinated by municipal waste, so that would be fascinating. Uh, Thank you very much, Michael. I'm glad to welcome you on the territory of our favorite city. I was born here and I work here and I am the main environmentalist here. And that's why the issues, environmental issues and innovative issues connected with that are very close to me. And uh, we are, of course, very pressed for time. And I can say that Moscow is the most important innovative platform in Russia and uh, about uh, 1,000 um, uh, cities have it as a role model and of course waste disposal is also very important and crucial issue here uh, I can give some example we have about uh, 35 million uh, wastes uh, a year and so it's only in Moscow and among them 3.5 million uh, are hazardous uh, wastes and they need to be recycled in a special way they need to be separated and uh, these are uh, wastes uh, from um, municipal wastes, and plus we have 1.5 million is a large scale um, waste, solid waste, and it needs to be uh, recycled and treated. And those are the waste which need to be recycled in a, a serious way. And uh, with other kinds of uh, construction wastes, um, and uh, different scrap uh, uh, have been solved. Uh, uh, to some extent, and so uh, the problem is nevertheless um, um, decided. And so uh, uh, we uh, understand uh, all the world trends. We have lots of information, and 
our department uh, has a database uh, on uh, uh, environmental and innovative technologies. We uh, scrutinize the information and try to implement it here. And the topic of uh, waste disposal is uh, a social one, and the cost of uh, treatment of one ton of solid wastes, uh, household wastes, is uh, can't be compared with the European level. Uh, Moscow has the highest level and highest uh, price is 3,000 rubles per one ton. And if we talk uh, about Finland or Sweden, these are 100, 500 euro. Uh, so uh, the difference is clear. And uh, of course, it's a serious issue. And uh, they can be, we can use any technology. And we have d don't have any limitations. We have only economic parameters, because any investor starting to uh, calculate the scheme, uh, he doesn't understand uh, what are the guarantees, who is the guarantee of the payback, and how, will, uh, how the scheme will be implemented in the future. And basically, he's right. And uh, that's why uh, the main point we are dealing with at the moment, and we are finishing with it, uh, because Moscow, it's not a separate uh, subject. We work together with the Moscow region because we clearly understand that the problem must be uh, solved uh, within the framework, not of one city, but of the region on the whole, because the amount of solid wastes is increasing. And I think we found an economic model to uh, uh, bring uh, uh, this uh, plan in motion, and we have concluded 15-year uh, 15 years, 15 year contracts, uh, and we have a, a lot of um, uh, shipment companies uh, beforehand, and, and now we have uh, 10 districts in Moscow, uh, the central and other, uh, a, thousand, uh, a thousand northern, uh, eastern, western, and other districts, and so each district has one uh, shipment company and one imp operator, and the contract is for 10 years. So it's the 15-year guarantee for the budget. So uh, this mechanism uh, enables investor uh, have a right, in any case, to attract uh, any investment and to plan its activity. Uh, to construct uh, buildings, and of course, uh, contract liabilities of uh, an operator uh, have uh, uh, stipulated the demands. We want to see innovation, uh, new objects t uh, for waste treatment. Uh, these are liabilities to um, separate uh, wastes and uh, to state the percent um, amount of uh, wastes, uh, which is increasing uh, annually, and so we need to separate it and to um, dispose it. And uh, that's, uh, that is the horizon for us, uh, 2020. By this year, each operator uh, will need to implement the plan and to uh, show up the results of 40 percent. And we started with 15. Uh, we have now uh, six districts with contracts concluded. And they need to show the parameter of 15 percent. And 15 percent will be separated wastes, which will be recycled. And I hope that in the nearest two or three years, together with the Moscow region, um, there will be, uh, uh, we will um, establish uh, waste treatment clusters and eco parks, uh, which will provide for all the necessary functions in the sphere of waste disposal and waste treatment. And uh, we will have some scientific cluster in each of them, and those wastes. Um, uh, which uh, we are uh, some kinds of waste which can't be disposed will be stored and they will wait for the moment when our innovative thinking will help us to understand how we can treat this kind of um, waste and so I'm very optimistic about the future and I think that at least in Moscow region uh, we have managed to uh, show the role model for other subjects of the Russian Federation and I think uh, that uh, within uh, three five years we must uh, close this problem and uh, create our, our own cluster for waste disposal. Uh, waste is one of our greatest natural resources. It's there and uh, there's got to be ways to use it. I'm intrigued on that the 11 different districts have all signed different contracts. 
Are you already seeing the elements of competition come in where one company's saying, well, we'll try out methane capture or we'll actually try building materials where they're willing to experiment with things to actually drive up their revenue and attract investors? I think it's a good question because uh, we have a bidding, a bidding procedure. We don't choose any company. We have uh, bidding and uh, we look at a lot of competitive firms and uh, we have about 10-15 uh, companies which are large-scale companies. It's not a small-scale business sector because it's uh, not it's impossible to raise this issue, this problem from uh, the zero point it's impossible for small scale companies small scale companies deal with only recycling and they will have this um, uh, sector in our eco parks perhaps if they want to if they want to recycle plastic bottles for instance we will give them venues platforms they will sort plastic and uh, they will recycle it and sell it as uh, recycled material for small-scale companies uh, who can uh, develop this chain further. And that's the main point. And in any case, we have um, uh, large uh, high-profile players, and they're all famous. And they work not only with waste dispo disposal. These are uh, construction companies, oil companies, and they, ent they are entering the sector. And I don't think it's a bad thing. It shows that we have reliable partners. Um, I implore the audience, please, any questions, uh, sir? Hi, Uther Charlton Stevens, uh, Volgograd State University. Um, I'd like to ask if any members of the panel are aware of this uh, experimental city um, near to Tianjin in China and the collaboration between the Singapore government and the Chinese government on that project of trying to create a sort of perfectly green environment on a city scale and whether people think that that kind of pilot project is is more a kind of novelty or a way for testing technologies or uh, is it a distraction from trying to deal with the problems of the existing cities that are straining under all of these uh, environmental issues so is anyone familiar with the uh, Chenjin uh, project at all Return the microphone, maybe he, uh, if you could explain that to us. Yeah, I, I think they're, they're trying to invest serious state funds to create uh, an entire kind of mini city, um, which will, where every, all the construction will be uh, green and the, it should be a kind of self-supporting environment on many environmental measures. Um, so I, I just thought that was an interesting case that, uh, well, if, if people aren't aware of, they might want to look at. No, definitely look those up. I mean, Irina. Yes, we are well aware of the Chinese city and its collaboration with Singapore, but I'd like to say that Russia has similar experiments. Uh, we have established a Kazan smart city near Kazan, and the ideology is the same. Uh, the old city has its traditional ways to develop, and the new part of the city will use green technologies, and then we'll compare what's better. Yes, I'm always. Uh, I'm also familiar with the project and Shenzhen. Uh, uh, the first time I went to China and the first city I visited was Shenzhen, and I was amazed. I think it's a role model, and I think there is nothing bad about it. I think it's a normal practice, but Shenzhen, the old Shenzhen, uh, didn't have so many old buildings as Moscow has. And I think that uh, what is possible in Shenzhen is impossible in other cities. So we need to look for new approaches. But I think that the fact uh, that it's easier to um, build uh, a green city from the zero point is, uh, is, uh, is clear than Very, the hope is always great. But then you look at the actual results, it's sometimes thin. Maybe, is it too ambitious? Maybe instead of thinking about green cities, we should just say, let's encourage building owners to think about green building or think about LED to really think smaller. And therefore, if enough people actually contribute to this, then you do have a green city by default. I mean, would that be an easier way to go about this problem? You'd need less actors and less, it seems like less approval. 
I don't think you can actually build anything big without a vision. No, there's no way it's going to work. But again, you cannot fix an idea of green, right? You can only fix some of the targets, like being zero net energy or zero waste, right? And then you use different technologies to reach that. You cannot tell everybody to use LEDs because, you know, tomorrow we might have a different technology, right? Which would be even 10 times more efficient than that one. But you definitely need a big vision for every territory and every city to uh, proceed. Uh, speaking then, uh, George, on that same subject, I'd love to hear... Oh, I'm sorry, here we go. Hello, my name is Ksenia Agapova. I represent GLL and I'm involved in green building business. I'm doing BREAM lead DGNB assessments. Just, uh, and I will talk again about my favorite green building standards because, uh, as just mentioned, sometimes it's, it takes very long for a new innovative technology to get adopted by the market. And I think that green building standards and standards in general, which are voluntary, they help a lot us to adopt the standards on a, on a, uh, on a bigger scale. And I see in Russia at the moment we've got approximately I think one, approximately one million of square meters buildings certified to BREEAM or LEED standards, international standards. And I see quite interesting examples of how developers first start with small steps, just approaching the standards, and while moving forward, uh, they introduce more and more innovative technologies. For example, LED technology. One of my clients, he is a developer, a warehouse developer. He started with certification of a very small um, uh, already built warehouse and he achieved past level and he said that we want to be market leaders and he moved forward and they introduced uh, quite a few innovative technologies including uh, they were the first ones in uh, Moscow region to introduce LED technology on their warehouses and uh, uh, also motion detectors technology on their warehouse and the scale is tremendous because they are going to certify 500 square thousand square meters of warehouse premises so um, I just wanted to stress the role of green building standards uh, in turning step by step our existing buildings and new construction into green cities thank you uh, kind of following up on that too is maybe the the efficiency industry are we underselling it? I, you know, I find I, I interview a number of people who put in LEDs, stores and things like that, and what they'll point to is they'll say actually we've been seen an increase in actually uh, you know customer engagement. People spend more time in our store now that we've changed the lights. They don't they don't know it, they don't talk about it, but we're seeing that we're seeing a slight uptick in sales and things like that. Has there been a failure of the industry actually to emphasize these or document it at least? I mean I don't know whether these. When people tell me these anecdotes, they're very true, but I've not seen a thousand cases. I mean, maybe the data is too early, but is the is efficiency is just such a tough sell. Have we been underselling it by not focusing on these? Well, I wouldn't say efficiency is a tough sell as long as economics work. But as I said before, leadership is essential and also sometimes willingness, grassroots. I mean, for example, Moscow doesn't have any environmental programs for its residents, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm all pro-environmental, I'm conscious, I'm running environmental club. I want to be green, I can't recycle. People who actually want to recycle in Moscow, they take their bags on a subway or in a car, you know, a few times a week to some special place. Uh, and I, I met my building manager just last night, he was walking his, his dog, and he's just like a regular building management guy, and he's like, Listen, I just looked at our bills. I need some energy efficiency help from you, my friend. So, yeah, now actually I'm going to work with my building management guy, which is, I don't know, a couple of hundred apartments to help green my building. And uh, that's grassroots. We get no help or subsidies or anything from the city. We just get high tariffs, which, also, which is always the best help. High tariffs on resources always make the best green choices. And that's something we're lacking in Russia. I would very much disagree with that. I actually work with a number of companies that uh, retrofit large commercial buildings and skyscrapers, retrofit factories, and also homes. 
nearly every one of them universally says people like the idea of efficiency, but getting them to act on it is near impossible. You'll even speak to, uh, I met somebody, who, the highest, they had a factory as a client and their highest fee was energy, right? Their highest expense. And yet getting the factory owner to move and actually act on it was near impossible. They said, we don't want to interfere with production. We have other issues to take on. It's always something that gets pushed to the background. You know, it's like, they like the idea of it. Even if you look at all the, the companies in the US trying to do this, it, every time it's, it, projects come up to the edge and then the building permit doesn't get filed. Everyone backs away. And this is, it's uh, one of the lowest uh, closure rates of any sort of energy policy, any, any Uh, I would like uh, to know this uh, trend. It's universal, uh, and I've noticed it uh, visiting other countries. Unfortunately, uh, not always energy efficient uh, cities. Uh, well, citizens support and they have some kind of saving considering uh, the utility costs, uh, but not always it leads to the generation uh, de decrease because our major aim, uh, if we talk about the environment, uh, energy consumption uh, is used uh, not to uh, waste the energy resources, uh, oil, gas, uh, coal, anything else, uh, different energy carriers. But if uh, if en all energy saving uh, uh, programs do not lead to uh, energy saving, what are we talking about then? Uh, where uh, we do have uh, this uh, green ideology, we don't have it. Hello. Um, uh, I would like uh, to support um, uh, the Ministry of Environment of Moscow and develop his idea. Uh, the thing is that we uh, are developing economy, and we need, uh, in, in order to develop, we need more resources, including energy. And the word green uh, as a kind of economy of resources. Uh, we don't like it, uh, this word, uh, because uh, we would like to understand uh, the word green directly. We have 20% uh, of territory occupied uh, uh, by uh, natural um, uh, trees uh, in Moscow. These are not parks, uh, just uh, protected areas. Uh, they uh, have uh, uh, natural ballast uh, in uh, trees, in uh, animals. Uh, we do even have elk, so we have elk island. Uh, and we think that uh, this direct protection of uh, these green areas uh, is an input to green environment rather than uh, the constraint uh, of use of water, for example, or, or energy, because uh, that is directly green. Um, anyone care to respond? Or any? Uh, well, I would like to respond that uh, we can't take green, the word green, as uh, just uh, green trees. Uh, uh, green cities are the ideology, and I would say this the ideology of future. Uh, this is a long-term aim. Uh, which is uh, which uh, humankind should a aim because all resources are finite and the possibilities of the ecosystem are limited and as soon as, uh, as we th start thinking about it and as soon as we move forward to this goal the more efficient will uh, the result will be and when we're talking about green cities we should understand that a green city is a comprehensive uh, uh, definition um, uh, we can talk about green city uh, generation cities uh, 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 green city over the first generation, over the second generation, and with the growth of the innovation technologies, uh, we will ch uh, our notion of the green city will change. Uh, the first stage is energy efficiency, for example, uh, and the um, treatment of waste. The second stage is, are the technology that would produce less waste and less exhaust gases. Uh, uh, so the notion of the green city will transform um, simultaneously with the uh, potential of science and technology. Instead of calling it an ideology, it might be better to call it a culture, because if you look at certain cities like Tokyo, for instance, for a large city, it's incredibly clean, yet there's very few garbage cans all over the place. San Francisco, where I live, there's garbage cans all over the place, and people just throw trash on the sidewalk. It's awful. So, but it's a matter of inculcating those values. If, you know, ideology sometimes can cloud that. Um, sir. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alexei. I'm a venture investor and I had a company, uh, innovative company in water treatment. Our company is lo uh, located in Luxembourg and we uh, had a long way with our product to the German market. And I would like to uh, offer my remark uh, as to the green cities considering the development of technology. Uh, uh, German government have an interesting experience. At one p uh, time, uh, they uh, invented uh, um, windmills, and uh, uh, the return of investment period uh, for the windmills was 135 years. Uh, what am I leading to? Uh, the concept of a green city uh, has a high risk of being based uh, not on uh, the most innovative technologies uh, uh, that actually go in the avant-garde. And who is there? Uh, uh, in every country, and Russia is not an exception here, uh, there are startups, uh, small companies uh, that don't have money uh, even to uh, uh, carry out pilot uh, tests with uh, water supply systems with uh, large enterprises. And uh, uh, during the last three years, I've seen only two successful examples in Sweden and Germany how they solved uh, this problem. They made uh, two testing uh, a, a testing ground. One is located uh, in the center of Stockholm, uh, another one near München, uh, 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 near Munich. Uh, and uh, every producer, every sectoral producer. Um, they are narrow, quite narrow uh, industrial, and uh, each uh, producer can uh, install his equipment, his product uh, uh, at uh, exclusively experimental uh, basis. Uh, and I think that Russia passed a long way, uh, and it uh, took Europe several years, um, and we created Skolkova Rosnana uh, as a result of this win, different uh, technoparks. Uh, we can argue about the success of this project, um, um, but it seems to me that uh, uh, we are uh, uh, limited from these green cities by a small uh, by a small crack, and this crack is called the platforms, uh, the grounds for. Uh, small uh, developers, mm, for non-professional uh, inventors. Mm, you see, uh, uh, this is the topic in innovation. A person comes, uh, for example, he works, uh, he developed uh, something in chemistry, and he is a lawyer himself. And he comes with his uh, development uh, to a technical director and says, uh, uh, for the, for the audience, is there, or for the... the uh, uh, I don't have a question, but uh, I just wanted to say that uh, in this topic, we lack one, uh, one uh, uh, connection uh, that is located somewhere, uh, somewhere behind, and we do not see it when we when we come to Europe. Uh, we don't see it when uh, we don't see it when we come to America. But this, uh, we have this uh, uh, thing, and without it, we cannot successfully implement the uh, 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 green cities based on the most uh, state-of-the-art technologies. Uh, we shouldn't buy something produced uh, far abroad, but uh, we should have our own uh, innovations. Uh, That's a very good, uh, very good point. Um, anyone else? Uh, sir. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for an interesting discussion. Uh, I would like to comment. Uh, I represent uh, uh, a company, also a technical company, and my colleague uh, Alexander from Microsoft said that uh, our company CISC has an incentive uh, in the development of cities. Uh, it's smart in connecting communities an incentive. And uh, from 2006, we had um, up to uh, 50 uh, introductions in many cities. And two examples, because we have a uh, um, few, uh, we have a small time. Uh, Korea has a Songdo um, a town, and CISC is one of the investors uh, into the uh, company that provided ICT strategy for this city. Uh, and this city should get the certificate uh, in green building the certificate of uh, lead neighborhood development. That is an example of a city which was created from scratch. Uh, that's uh, 40 uh, billion of investment. 
Uh, but that's a real example that you can go and uh, see and touch uh, what how everything works. And for sure, we have examples uh, also in Russia, uh, in the Moscow region. Uh, that's a territory of Moscow now. But uh, here we have a, ter a territory called Skolkovo. Uh, we develop the strategy of its development as well. And in this city, in this town, uh, uh, the ba uh, majority of objects of new construction will comply with the certificate uh, uh, lead silver. Uh, this, uh, would all, when the uh, town will be finished, uh, this would be an example of the green city as well. So we have examples of green cities, uh, uh, both abroad and uh, in Russia. Maybe someone could answer this for Bream. In, in, in the U.S. lead right now, one of the driving forces with, um, with lead is that they're connecting it to demand response programs. You can get a lot of lead points by saying your building will be connected and you'll actually dim during peak power hours. Are they doing the same thing with the European standards? Because that's all of a sudden, instead of having the, the static sense of you know, the looking in the materials and the chemicals and things like that, you're, you're linking it to data and actual energy consumption, which really is a step forward. Really, it, it, it can allow you to lock in or keep those, those benefits uh, ongoing. I mean, is there any attempt to do that in Europe or is it strictly something we see in the States right now? Too bad Ksenia left because she works a lot with uh, green standards and certification in Russia. But I'd, I believe that about half our certification is LEED and only half is BREAM, uh, the English, and nobody's u almost nobody's using the ger German DJMB or the Russian standard. So LEED, same system, same points. I think that in Russia and in Moscow in particular, we have the uh, character of recommendation for green standards, but they have been endorsed. And I think it's a great breakthrough on the level of the Russian Federation, including the definition of these um, standards, both European and Amer American uh, organizations of standardization uh, have been scrutinized. And uh, we understood that the most adaptive uh, we uh, define the most adaptive ones to the Russian reality, and we must understand that green materials are uh, mat uh, construction materials. And in order to restructure the uh, industry in Russia, which uh, produces uh, construction materials, and to bring it to standardization, no matter to which one, American or European, we need a lot of uh, time and investment. That's why we are starting with recommendations. There are some companies which partially started to implement them. And the next step is the following. The government of Moscow is uh, going to endorse uh, the standards for social objects, schools, uh, elderly houses, and kindergartens. So I think it will be the first experience uh, when uh, social objects, including Russia, uh, will be um, certified on the legal basis and it will be the demand. And uh, of course, it will lead to the increase of costs up to 20 or 30 percent, and it will lead to the increase of uh, price for traditional construction. but. I think that within uh, the run of the time, there will be the payback during three, five years, uh, according to our estimates. And I think that lead uh, uh, can also exist in Russia. Why not? I think we should not only rely on rating instruments like BREEAM and, and, um, and LEED. Also, uh, simple legislation can help a lot in, in sustainable building. For instance, in the Netherlands, for 20 years now, it is more than 20 years, it's forbidden to landfill construction waste. So uh, if there is um, a demolition site going on, a demolition process going on, all the materials are separated and are recycled because it's forbidden to landfill. So it has created a complete new industry. Another example is uh, the simple building code, because the building code prescribes the minimum that you have to fulfill. Well, the building code, uh, the RC value for residential buildings, for instance, is now already 3.5, so that's standard. And uh, we are talking even about to make the RC 5 in, in, in the building code. So then all new buildings have to comply with this value. Well, then, then the building code is actually prescribing sustainable building already. 
So if you want to do sustainable building, you have to go beyond the building code, and that is quite difficult. Becoming, it's becoming more and more difficult, and we say it's a moving target. Uh. But at least then almost everyone becomes a sustainable builder by default. Um, <laughs> any other questions, any other comments? I think we're getting actually, uh, we might be at time or over time. Um, I had one, if nobody else does. Energy storage, that's the biggest uh, topic right now in the States and microgrids, you know, it's resiliency, saving energy, saving grids, uh, a lot of uses with data and incentives. Is there a lot of activity going on in Europe right now or in China uh, trying to implement this? I know it's expensive right now, but the, the savings, the potential for storage and microgrids is just is phenomenal. Uh, when, when people are putting out their green cities plans, is there, is there a lot of consideration being given to energy storage and microgrids as a way to deliver power versus the old centralized power plant with the losses of efficiency and things like that? Is there, are people already baking that into their plans in, um, in, in Europe and Asia, as anyone know? I, I, in the US, it's a big concern, so and it's, a big, it's a big topic of interest. India as well, actually. India is one of the biggest markets for storage. At present, if anyone constructs uh, using green, in, uh, green technologies, uh, the state provides for certain benefits, and these benefits are used uh, depending on the city, uh, the, and they account for uh, 50, uh, 100 yuans for one square meter. Uh, give a big applause for actually our panelists. They did a fantastic job and we covered a lot of territory, so if you could do that and thank you again for coming to Open Innovation.